I initially made a massive mistake in in his death, which was so he's you know up against the statue and he's reaching up to to Cristobal, and then you it was a close up of his hand, and then you saw Sally's hand come into frame, and she puts his hand into Cristobal's hand. And Sarah's like, "What do we? Why am I here? Like, why why am I here?" He just held me and my son hostage, and then I realized later the answers were fan service. You know, I got insecure and I was like, the fans will love this. I told Anthony, I go, hey, we're going to go back and reshoot your death just a close up. And he went, oh, thank God. OK, good. <laughs> Hi, this is Bill Hader. I'm Anthony Kerrigan. This is uh, Stephen Root. I'm Aida Rogers. My name is Carl Hersan. Hi, my name is Wade Allen. Hi, I'm Gavin Kleintop. I am the uh, director. I play Noho Hank. Producer. I'm the executive producer. Co-creator. I'm the stunt coordinator for Barry. Co-showrunner. I'm the first assistant director. And I'm the cinematographer on Barry. I play Monroe Fuchs. I play Barry, and this is Bridie's Making the Scene. The pilot of Barry was the first thing I had ever directed professionally. So over the course of the series, I was able to kind of learn a lot and hone some skills. And I think as I got more confidence in that, Aida Rogers at the end of season three said, I think you should direct them all because you have it very clear in your head the way you want it to be. His directorial voice is so unique and so special that it just made the most sense for him to direct everything. I think she said, we can bring Martin Scorsese and you'd still be looking over his shoulder. <laughs> so I think, you know, why don't you just do them all? So, and I think the reason we felt comfortable doing it was because between Gavin Kleintop, the first AD, Aida, and the crew we had, we, we were such a well-oiled machine that I felt like for me to take on that workload and it not completely destroy me. <laughs> you are a fucking liar. The deal is off. Go fuck yourself. There was a lot of different ideas for what this shootout was gonna be. We scouted a handful of places and when we finally made it to that church, you could kind of see Bill just kind of walking around the space and going, I think this is gonna work, this is gonna be good. And then just looking at that lobby gave me the idea of the Technocrane shot. The big question was always like, are they going to let us do this all here? Because it was right next to sort of, you know, a big sort of hour of power type of church facility. And it was always in Bill's head that he wanted it to be very bloody. The floor is almost kind of like marbly. And so there was a very big concern about like, well, can we put blood on this floor? Like, will it stain? The first time I read that scene, I was gutted. I was gutted, but I was also thrilled because I knew in the hands of Stephen Root, these moments were just going to be played so delicately and so specifically. What the fuck happened to you? I found myself. In a tattoo parlor? No. Hank, my body tells the story of my journey. He told me early on uh, in season four where it was going to go. What he didn't specify was that I would be playing an entirely different character in the last three episodes of the show. I went through a gauntlet of pain, but that pain turned into pleasure. Pleasure manifested. Yeah. He said, look, I, I want you to play it kind of sexy. <laughs> and I said, Bill, I would never be cast as this. <laughs> I would never go up for this. Uh, but I'm thrilled to take the challenge. Fuchs is able to just completely deconstruct Hank in that moment. That this facade that Hank has had up since Cristobal's death, it begins to get cracked throughout the scene. And I say it in, in the long monologue that I do. And the only thing that'll make you forget is by being someone else. And that's kind of the core of of that episode and kind of the core of the show. When I was talking to Steven about that, I go, you know, it's it when you're talking to him, it's almost more like an AA meeting or something. It's not like, you know, you're persecuting him or something. It, it's more about a, uh, we have the same disease. If you can admit you did this, 
then I'll walk away. And it is a, a, a feeling of like, cause I have it too. I know I can relate to you. Steven and Anthony are such powerhouses as actors. It's just, you know, the only thing you really want to do is show them in close up and show just how much those two can express through performance. And we wanted to create tension by using some cutaways to the different groups of these gangsters and show the sides in these tableaus. It, it became kind of a visual language of the show that we were going to shoot inside characters, not do over the shoulder shots. It's a 27 millimeter lens, very close to their face. So it's like, there's no hiding. They look distorted. It doesn't make them look beautiful or anything like that. I mean, it, it, and that to me kind of played up the comedy of the show, but also the kind of, uh, you know, the ugliness and the rawness of it. I'm nothing like you, Fuchs. You're a weak, manipulative, pathetic little man. It is difficult when the camera is right here in your face. And I mean, there were moments where I could see Steven's eye, right? It's like he would do his best to kind of like make his way through all the machinery and I would get like his pupil right there. Anthony's back here. I can see him. I can maybe see one eye of him, but you have to be essentially motionless to do it, which is interesting and hard. Be natural, but don't move and go talk. <laughs> That's where you do trust the performance where you you really trust what you've uh, discovered and then you know it doesn't matter it doesn't matter if there's if there's a brick wall right in front of your face when you feel that emotional connection that you've built with the other actor that's what you rely on and you can even hearing their voice and what they're doing is 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 enough and i definitely discovered that watching you know the common brother movies and i probably owe those guys a royalty check for the amount i steal from them. And then of course we use a 27 millimeter lens and then Carl Hersey and the DP was like, you know, I found out that's what the Coen brothers use for clothes. I'm like, of course it is. <laughs> As a stunt coordinator, we had a number of challenges for this scene, a large number of people. Um, and that number of people were split between stunt performers and cast. We had wire work involved. And then, then getting to Bill's notes that he wanted this to all be one shot from when the shooting starts until Fuchs is walking John out to Barry. That was all one long shot. So that added an entire layer of complications in the best possible way. We did five passes of it where all the guys are shot. They did a pass with just light of the explosion. And then we did a pass where they put the smoke up in the air. So we had a smoke element. And then we blew out the windows in a pass. And then another pass, we pulled all those guys with ratchets. And then they laid it all together. And then once we got that right, we went, okay, let's move the camera. And then we move in and we find him on top of, you know, that he protected the kid. So that, to me, that scene and that shot, to me, was a, telling a story, which was literally him walking him through. It's like parting a sea of violence and him moving him through it and it's what he should have done with, with Barry. We had to to walk a lot slower in that scene than I would have wanted to because he had to get you know this guy's legs blown off this guy is moaning this guy doesn't have a head <laughs> so you had to be able to see all that stuff so I had to walk a lot slower with him than I wanted to do. Now, I thought that was one of the most beautiful stunts I'd ever seen and then there was absolute quiet there's no music there's just moaning and people dismembered, literally. Bill and Alex said when we started the show, it's like, this show's a comedy, but the violence is real and they won't mix. And Fuchs is being very loving and caring with him, saying, don't look down, I'm going to get you to your dad, your mom's okay. It's a really kind of beautiful thing that he does for this kid and Barry, considering who he thinks he is, you know. So it was interesting to me that the guy who thought he was great, which is Barry, kind of doesn't really learn anything, but the guy who thinks he's bad actually does something really beautiful. The shot after that shot where I give the kid back to Bill, 
we spent, I think, an hour and a half trying to make the outside of the building as dark as possible so I, my character could leave in the dark. Characters coming in and out of darkness has been kind of a motif through the whole show. It starts in season two, Barry comes out of darkness, and at the end of the season, he goes into darkness. There's a shot in season three when Sally is yelling at her agent, and she starts backing up into darkness. And so to me, it just felt like for that moment, he's the Fuchs that we know. You know, that's why Stephen Root is such a brilliant actor, is that I said, you know, right here, you're not the Raven, you're, you're Fuchs. You know, you're seeing this little boy that you love as Barry and you're giving him his son saying do a better job with him than I did with you and then he's giving him this second chance he's giving him a sense of redemption and then Stephen did this great thing where he kind of thinks and then goes all right that's not and he goes right back to being a raven and goes back into his lair which is darkness the editors when they put that scene together uh, as a joke I, I, uh, I, I run away into the, into the darkness. And the minute he goes into the darkness, you just hear <laughs> like, like birds taking off. <laughs> and he just went, no. It was kind of a last day at work joke. And I went, no way. And everybody started laughing. I was like, we're not doing that. And everybody started <laughs> laughing. Yeah, it, was, it was pretty good. I initially made a massive mistake in, in his death, which was I thought Sally and Noho Hank meeting was, was this really big moment in the show. And you see that they kind of have something in common, which is that they both love Barry. There was this thing where I thought, oh, they would connect. And so then when he was shot, it's embarrassing even talking about it. So he's you know, up against the statue and he's reaching up to, to Cristobal and then you, it was a close up of his hand and then you saw Sally's hand come into frame and she puts his hand into Cristobal's hand. And, and Sarah's like, what do we, why am I here? Like, why, why am I here? He just held me and my son hostage. <laughs> he almost got my son killed. Let's, let's think about this. I had no answer. And then I realized later the answers were fan service. You know, I got insecure and I was like, the fans will love this. Two, I was insecure and enough people have told me, wow, the show's so bleak. The show has gotten so bleak that I was like, oh, it should have a nice, hopeful moment. The editors, Ali and Frankie wouldn't even cut the scene together. <laughs> they were like, we're trying to cut around Sally putting his hand in the thing. And, it, and I go, that doesn't work, does it? And they were like, no. Um, it, it, no, why would she do that? It actually uh, was crystal clear at that point that it's like, oh yeah, this is this is not this is not earned necessarily. It's beautiful and indulgent and amazing, uh, but at the same time, Barry's not that. We went back and reshot it, and I, I I told Anthony, I go, hey, we're gonna go back and reshoot your death, just a close up, and he went. Oh, thank God. Okay, good. <laughs> and I was actually really excited to reshoot the death scene in general, because in the first draft of it, or in the first time we shot it, Hank was essentially getting a happy ending, where he was looking up and he found his peace by looking up at this statue of Cristobal. But instead, it was actually not that. It was Hank, you know, kind of sees how everything has kind of come to a head. My thought is, is that he wants to be a mobster, you know, in his scene with Chris Cabal, he's like, you want to be a crime lord, now you're a crime lord, this is what you do. And that's the life he chooses. he should die like that, which is afraid and alone. What was really beautiful about about the, the second time we shot it is that like there was more, it just felt like the, the stakes were much higher. And, and it felt more in keeping with the show. And he has Chris Cabal there, but it's, it's, it's not the same. He latches onto that hand and it's like, this is the, you did all this. It should be when you die, if you're lucky, the person you love is holding your hand, but he blew it. And this is now it's this, he's holding onto his denial or whatever it is. The statue to me is, you know, it's, it's kind of like the movie at the end. It's these, these false idols or something, you know, it's this thing that's supposed to 
you know, be in memory and, um, and kind of celebrate crystal ball, but it, it really is just this thing built. So Hank will feel better about himself, you know? And it, and so when, when Steven says denial is a tough thing, you know, it was very important to me that you see the crystal ball statue behind Hank. It's almost like crystal ball's ghost is, is behind him. And we did a thing earlier, you know, in, in 401 where he says, I feel, I mean, the wizard of Oz. Mm. I'm Dorothy. And Hank is like, I'm Dorothy. Okay, fine. You're Dorothy. I'm the Dean man. It's kind of amazing because that's like foreshadowing, you know, that Cristobal then becomes like a tin man of sorts. I find that stuff interesting. You know, other people might find it pretentious. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting. When you're shooting a scene that's as intense as that, you tend to ask the crew to step away, anyone that doesn't need to be there, and you reduce the camera experience down to a camera operator, myself, Bill, just a few people who are around help Anthony get into the moment he needs to be in for performance. Funnily enough, because of the camera angle and one of those technical things that we had to do, I like couldn't actually reach out and grab the, the, um, the statue. So Bill snuck in and just put his hand where it needed to be to bring that eyeline more engaged with the lens. Uh, and it wasn't really until after we shot the scene that that we all realized that Noho died holding Bill's hand. And it was really special, too, because it was just the last day. And, and, you know, I appreciate Bill so much. And, yeah, it was just a, a real beautiful moment of connection. The most visually emotive shot in the whole sequence was probably the camera pulling back on Hank alone, surrounded by dead bodies, holding Hank's hand as he dies. And the fact that Bill has brought back into the modern film language very well in the last couple of seasons is using fade outs, which seems deceptively simple, but it's become much more common to kind of hard cut to black as your exit cue on a scene. And Anthony had a good thing. He goes, oh, I... I said, what did you do on that take? That was really good. He goes, I'm seeing the darkness that Barry sees because I showed him that scene cut together of Barry getting shot and I go into black. So he's seeing darkness. Is what I, that's what he's playing. At least that's what he told me. And I, I thought that was interesting. I really wanted to connect all these moments of even back to season one and see who this character was back then and then who he is now and just really try to honor this person who has been through so much, I knew that what we created overall was so special. And especially, you know, having a character that was supposed to die in the first episode, I was like, I made it. <laughs> made it through to the end. Nice. <laughs> Hank will never die, you know? I'll, I'll bust him out at the grocery store every once in a while and be like, oh, wow, look at that. That's great. That's a great price, you know? What do you think? Should we get some eggplants? Yeah, great. <laughs> Freeze! Drop Put the gun! Down. Drop the fucking gun! Get him! Grab him! It's my hope that what people take away from Barry is a beautiful, heartbreaking, hilarious story. The algorithm felt it wasn't hitting the right taste clusters. T taste clusters. And it's gonna be something that you can watch many times and pick up on different things every time. I think that's part of how great the show was in terms of you don't know who's gonna make it through. You really don't. What resonates about Barry is that the world can both be scary and silly. No! You say, oh, we're just a bunch of swim instructors. That's the title. They can't cut that. Moments can be absurd and tragic, comedic and sad. Something so stupid can be edited with something that is so dramatic and serious and really good. Ronnie? Ronnie. These kinds of shows don't come along every day, like where you really love doing what you're doing and you really love the opportunity to make the show. I think everybody was really sad to see it go. I'm really glad you're here. 
Really? So much of what everybody did on that show is really just supporting Bill's vision. And it was a really, really solid one. I hope people find it funny. I do find it funny. The variety piece. You were in variety? 